three for hour three here as we welcome you back to America's Forum. I'm J.D. Hayward. And I'm John Bachman. Joining us here on the set is Howie Carr, Boston Herald columnist and radio host for WRKO. It's great to see you, Howie. Thank you, John. Of course, the Boston Marathon is just a week away. We want to talk about uh, the situation right now. We heard the mayor of Boston talking about how the uh, race will not be fundamentally changed. Of course, this year, city officials are strengthening the security presence along uh, the race route, introducing more stride and safety measures to ensure runners and spectators' safety and security. Boston Police Commissioner William Evans said there would be some uniform present, but most of the additional security will be in the form of undercover officers. Over 100 cameras have been installed along the route to monitor threats. In addition to having those officers on the ground, there will also be checkpoints along the route and surrounding marathon areas. Police have asked those attending to leave their backpacks and baby strollers at home to reduce bomb threats, although such items have not been officially banned. Commissioner Evans asked citizens to follow the rule of see something, say something, critically important as it always is, and urged anyone who sees suspicious activity to call 911 or text the word Boston to the number 69050. Again, that's looking ahead to the race. And uh, Howie, obviously, uh, in the wake of last year, you knew the city and the state and the federal government would respond. You know the heartbeat of Boston. Mm -hmm. Does the city have a right, have the right kind of mindset in terms of security? I, I think so, uh, J.D. You know, you just heard uh, the mayor say that uh, they don't want to fundamentally transform the, the marathon. But I think it's been made clear on a number of occasions that although you can bring a backpack to the, to the event, you prepare for a lengthy, uh, lengthy search, you know they're they're discouraging people from bringing anything anything in bags or but but they're not they're not uh, you know going about it and you know threatening to arrest people or anything like that. I, I think uh, they're doing the best they can. I mean it's you're in a you're in a tough situation. I mean this thing runs for uh, 26 miles through eight different towns. I mean anybody could theoretically do anything at any point along there. It's it's an impossible. You can't you can't uh, just uh, you know shut down the entire route. It's, it's impossible. Well, we understand that nothing will be completely secure, especially not in a free society. And you mentioned the unique nature of a 26.2 mile course that, uh, that goes throughout the Boston metropolitan mm -hmm. area. Given where we are on the calendar, uh, and I, I know we have not heard about any buzz, but you know from time to time we hear, well, there is buzz, there is chatter yes. out there. Have you guys heard anything in Boston? Any any groups stepping forward to claim they might try anything tomorrow? No, no. There's been there has been any there's been nothing about this. It, basically, uh, what's been going on over the last week, we talked about it last week, is just sort of uh, finger pointing about who was to blame for uh, for the Sarnia brothers getting through the uh, the the web of security that they had. Not no one no one I don't think really believes that there's going to be a problem this year. But we have to. Everyone has to be prepared, obviously. Yeah, and act as if, how, of course. And how important will it be for the collective psyche of the people of Boston to get this marathon behind them as a success so they can stop, talk, stop talking about the uh, 2013 oh, Boston Marathon? Yeah, it'll, I'm, yeah it'll, be like, uh, it'll be like the Red Sox winning the World Series in, in 2004, I think. It's just, it'll be a big monkey off of everybody's back. And, you know, there's going to be more people running in this marathon mm -hmm. than uh, any marathon except for the Centennial back in 1996. So there's a, it's, it's going to be a huge event, and, uh, you know, no one will be complaining about it. And uh, every, everybody, I mean, 100% of the population wants this thing to go well. I mean, you know, sometimes this can be a, a real a headache. You yeah, know? I sure, mean, you've got, you've got to, you know, you're a, uh, you, you know, you're a an invalid, and you've got to get an oxygen delivery. I mean, if you're living in certain places, you're not getting that oxygen delivery that day. You can't cross. If where I live, you can't cross the street to go to the post office for for eight hours. But no one's going to be complaining about that this year. Well, you and I have spoken before about. Uh, the Boston Globe to name names and other media outlets offering an indulgent interpretation of the right. terrorists and their families. It's not just media media outlets though, right? How, as I understand it, the whole thing with the surviving bomber, the younger uh, Zarnov brother, yeah. he, he leaves a suicide note, what he believes is going to be a suicide note. And Correct. He's talking about he thinks he's bleeding to death in yeah. that boat. And he's, he's writing about how this is this was taken as retribution for Muslims right. in response yeah, Muslims, to... Muslims, you know, uh, America is killing Muslims, and we Muslims are one people, so that's why we did this. That's what he says. Now, the, the case of 
the Commonwealth's governor, Deval Patrick. What has the governor been up to to try and get involved in revisionist history on this? Well, well, first of all, it, it was pretty clear from the start that this was Muslim terrorism. No one, no one's going berserk, and you know they're not any, uh, you know, no one's, you know, getting tar and feathers out and talking about getting Muslims or anything like that. He comes out, warns everybody on Wednesday, don't take this out on Muslims. Who's taking it out on Muslims, Governor? So then Friday night they get the they get the note. The police get the note. They take this guy uh, into custody, the the second bomber. On that Sunday, 36 hours later, he goes on CBS's uh, Face the Nation with Bob Schieffer, and Schieffer asks him. Governor, do we have any um, motive yet for, for what, why they did this? And uh, Deval Patrick says, uh, no, no, Bob, we don't know what made these young fellas do this. Mm. And, it, you know, and then a couple of days later, the note's released, and we, we know that he had it on Friday night, and he wouldn't, he wouldn't tell anybody, and, you know, in Massachusetts or anywhere else, what, the, the reality of the situation. It was a, uh, it, it was a very uh, un, unpopular decision by, on his part to be politically correct. Well, well, here is the paradox. We just talked about all the security and all the things going on, yet rhetorically there are people on the left who, in, in the name of political correctness or heightened sensitivity, want to excuse. I mean, I cannot understand why the word Islamofascism has been right. banished from the political lexicon when it is a reality. Right. Well, you know, Deval Patrick is one of the most politically correct governors there is. I mean, he, he the uh, the first year that he was uh, he was governor on uh, on the anniversary of 9/11, he uh, you know we we have a big a big commemoration in Massachusetts because we were like the third or fourth hardest hit state. And uh, he he gets out there and he says, you know what this was? This was a uh, uh, a failure to communicate, you know, like uh, what, what am I? What we're watching Strother Martin and Cool Hand Luke? A failure to communicate. He said it was a failure on, on behalf of people to love one another. A, a terror attack is a failure to love one another. That's what he said. I, th the efforts that people engage in to deal with euphemism or to deal with the delusion. This isn't a, even attack. a euphemism. I mean, this is just total, total falsehood. It's, it, he, it, and then, as we've talked about, the Globe, the Globe said this was homegrown terrorism, homegrown, meaning We know that's US. absolutely not to be the case. Absolutely not the case. And they, they described, the, the, one, the, the thing that irritates me the most, I can never get over it, is Tamerlane, the guy that was killed, right. 25 years old, Seven people at the age of at the age of 25 in cold blood. He, he shy. He slashed three 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 drug dealers' throats. Put the bombs in. Shot the MIT police officer in cold blood. Hope described him as a stay-at-home dad. Uh, he was someone who was happy to enjoy the fruits of American entitlements, which is another situation that mm -hmm. goes on with people who with people who uh, who come here and, and intend to do us harm. Howie, right. as always, uh, your insights are, are welcomed. Uh, any favorites uh, for the marathon? Um, I'm going to say it's somebody from Kenya that's going <laughs> to Well, always, we'll see. Always a safe bet. <laughs> given, given the altitude at which those runners <laughs> yes. train, uh, that has been the case y yes. more often than not. Yes, recently. for about the last 25 years. <laughs> Very good. Howie Carr, we do appreciate your time and your perspective. Thank uh, you, on JD. the upcoming anniversary there in Boston. And never too late to get Howie's book, Rap Man, as well. Always good to get that as well. You can find Howie on WRK Radio in Boston and his columns on the bostonherald.com. When we come right back, Wall Street is still reeling from a tough week last week. We'll take a look at what investors should do and where the market might be going right after this break.